15. Please proceed to gate 15. Flight 137 to Aberdeen. Please proceed to gate 15. Hello? Hello, it's me. Milton, where are you? Heathrow. So no dinner tonight? I'm afraid not. But I've got this job in Scotland. Lucky you. Where? I'm a few miles outside of Aberdeen. I could pop in and say hello to your parents. You could, Milton. But you won't. Oh, you were up there recently, weren't you? Recently? I saw my parents in May, Milton. May. What's the job? No horrifying details, please. It's an odd case. Close case, actually. More favor than job, if I'm brutally honest. <laughs> you always are. Milton? I'm pregnant. That is... surprising news. We're three months gone. I'm due in February. When are you back? Uh, as soon as I can. Maybe tomorrow morning. Okay. I love you. I love you too. My name is Detective Chief Inspector Milton Pritchett. I've been with the Met's murder investigation team for two months shy of 11 years. I'm going to Aberdeenshire to investigate a most unusual case, the kind more commonly found in paperback than in a file on my desk. And at the merry age of 41, in a departure lounge at Heathrow, standing on a coffee stained pink and purple acrylic carpet, I find out that in six months from now, I'll be a father. If the world was just, I'd be with Lydia now, or celebrating on my friend Alan Williams' 40-footer, crashing through the waves of the Solent, and stuck here in Old Meldrum, literally the end of the Earth. As is evident, when the Commissioner calls in a favour, you don't say no, even if it's outside my jurisdiction, here in bloody Scotland. File Report 17C12. Ten days ago, on August the 19th, at Meldrum House, Graham Fletcher and Emily O'Hara tied the knot. On what would have been their first night of marriage, with all the guests still in the house, Graham kills his newlywed wife. After Graham's arrest, he's transferred to Morton Hall Prison, where two days later, he hangs himself. Graham's family, being of influence, insists on an investigation. They want more answers. His motive, why? I've studied the 84 pages of witness testimonies in detail. And whilst wading through the slush, the bile, and the regrets, I found some points of fact. The answer lies in a single message that Emily sent minutes before she died. A straightforward case, one might think. It's really so simple. Besides, the scene of the crime is the most reliable of witnesses. Meldrum House. An imposing edifice born by this remote landscape for more than 700 years. Over the centuries, the house has stood silent to the dark deeds of its occupants. I am the first person to cross the threshold since the night of the murder. The housekeeper opens up, but he refuses to enter, because he says the real killer is still inside. According to him, the house is haunted by a demon. That pill corroborates another testimony, which states that Meldrum House is evil. The ghost made Graham kill Emily. A rock-solid statement, if you believe in houses of evil. Ghosts. One of Scotland's great industries, as I discovered. My research did stretch to the legend of the White Lady. Lady Isabel Douglas was pushed out of a window to her death by her husband. The reason has remained a mystery, but as many have claimed, the White Lady has haunted the house ever since. She moves things around, she starts her favorite music box. It would appear all ghosts have favorites. Back to the wedding night murder. August 19th, 6.15 p.m. Over a hundred guests were seated in groups of eight, drinking and chatting. 
The speeches. The bride's father sheds a tear. Graham declares his love. Witness 49 recalls the best man's risque anecdotes. As is customary, Emily and Graham were first to dance. First abnormality. Almost everyone agrees that Emily appears dizzy after anyone dances and sits down. Witness 65 states, she looks a little pale. 11.55pm, the late supper. Everybody toasts the happy couple. Second abnormality. Emily doesn't touch her champagne and only eats the pickles. Then, excusing herself, she stands up in a flurry, says she's not feeling well and rapidly leaves the room. At this point, Graham's foggy mind is still enjoying the state of blissful ignorance. With her condition so undeniable, why would the blushing bride not confide in the man who's now her lawful husband? 12.37 a.m. Some of the guests are playing bridge in the drawing room, including <laughs> Graham's best man, Carol Carr. Graham appears in the doorway, unsteady on his feet, asking for his wife. He has an old book in his hands. When asked, he says he found it next to an old music box. Someone tells him, Emily's in the Laird suite, lying down. Graham staggers out. Carol wants to go after the newlywed husband, but the table tells him, in no uncertain terms, to sit down. Abnormality number three. Although Carol is a formidable player, he loses a winning hand because he's distracted by a text message. Graham's legs project him in zigzags towards the suite, but the swirling mud pools in his head are still revealing the indigestible fact of his wife's adultery. Yes, Emily is expecting a child, but not by Graham. It's Carol's. Graham's best man is the real father. 12.50. Emily sends another text message as Graham enters the room. Abruptly, she puts the phone to one side. Too late. Graham has the proof. The poor thing tries to flee into the bathroom. He follows, and in his rage, he lunges at her. She falls back, a sickening thud. Her eyes gaze out from an empty casing. Graham just stands there, staring at the body of his pregnant wife. And that's how they find them. A simple story of betrayal, revenge, and drunken rage, all hinged on a text message. Case closed. Graham, the son and lover, becomes Graham, the destroyer of lives, and his best friend becomes the biggest bastard. believe in ghosts. I do believe in unexplained signs, in the hidden fears that drive our imaginings, and maybe in a gust of wind. But one thing's for certain. When I first walked down this corridor, this book was not here. What's more, I know that I'm alone in this building, not another living soul. This is not just any book. It tells the story of Isabel Douglas, the White Lady, a woman betrayed by her husband, Lord William Meldrum. In her loneliness, she wandered the moor, seeking solace in self-pity. But self-pity turned to self-loathing, and she determined to cast off her servitude to circumstance and unlock her desires. With her husband in India chasing game trophies, Isabel Douglas drew nearer to his closest friend, Captain Charles Gordon. Only hours before she was murdered, it says Isabel Douglas came from around the stables. But this is written in dialect. It may just as easily mean from above the stables, What is this curious place? A wine cellar? Crypt? Priest hole? No. What did Emily do just before she was murdered? What gave her away? A message. She sent a message to her lover, Carol. This place is a pigeon loft. Lady Meldrum came here to send a message to her lover, the captain. 
an 18th century SMS. How ironic. In October 1753, when the Lairds are five year visiting, Lady Meldrum is late for dinner because her corset is being resized around the bosom. The White Lady is pregnant, and not by her husband who was on another continent when she conceived. Maybe the wind sweeping them all spills her secret. Maybe the heather whispers of her treachery. Heading home, Lord William Meldrum is alive to her duplicity. The closer he rides to Meldrum House, the sharper his conviction. The largest hunting trophy of his career drapes over the carriage bench, staring in lifeless ferocity. He storms into the house, blasting the oak doors aside, forewarning his helpless prey of his savage intent, charges up the stairs and into her bedroom. Meldrum manhandles his wife. His rage builds as he curses her existence. The back of his hand connects time and again until she lies splayed on the floor. She pulls herself upright, facing him in front of the window, bloodied and sobbing, and with child she bellows, her voice gritted by her boiling contempt. His brain short circuits and the demon strikes out. The shattering of glass, her body cuts the air as she plummets to her death. Two murders, the same motive. One ten days ago, and the other 259 years ago. The distant husband, the bored, neglected wife, the best friend taking his role too far. A toxic cliche. Both crimes committed in Meldrum House, where the timeless sin of men's impotence is laid bare to jeering walls and golden floors. What other crimes is Meldrum House hiding? What other cases should I reopen from its guilty past? Why is it these very strange things happen? Does history play diabolical tricks on those who enter this house? Of Emily and Graham? Maybe their fates were sealed when their lives crossed. Maybe it was Meldrum House. I don't know. They're both dead now. To Lady Isabel Meldrum, the white lady. Although I could never have met her, I'm in her debt. I need to get back to London. A normality. A night in with the lady in my life and maybe a pint or two with Alan and the lads. Enough of cruelty, at least for a while. keeping these notes. Lay these torments to rest. Six months from now, I'll be a father. 